In our society, we have one really big problem. We're terrible lovers. And I'm not talking about what happens or what doesn't happen in German bedrooms. <laughs> I'm talking about real and true love. I mean, you just have to look at the number of divorces. Last year, there have been 150,000 divorces in Germany, according to the statistical office. Or which is an easier option <laughs> to make sure that we are kind of terrible lovers. You just go into a random kind of bookstore and look at the exploding numbers of self-help books concerning love and relationships. Or you just swipe through Tinder. You get the point? I guess we are terrible lovers. But, but we are also great dreamers and believers. I mean, you just have to look at the number of marriages. Last year, there have been over 400,000 marriages. So sounds like there is hope. Or again, you just go into a random kind of bookstore, look at the exploding numbers of self-help books concerning love and relationships that are actually bought by people who are indeed interested in improving their love lives. Or you just swipe through Tinder until you find someone who actually wrote more than one emoji in his description. You get the point, I guess. People want to believe in love. At least that's what I want to. And let me, let me just assume that you want to, even if it's just for the next few minutes. So I hope you're all with me when I dare to make a claim. We want to love. We want to find that one person that makes everything fall into place. But we tend to believe that we need help to find that person. And I mean help in the form of destiny, help in the form of luck, or for the not so romantic people, help in the form of coincidence. Maybe help in the form of that one prince on the white horse, or that glittering shoe on the stairs, which will magically lead us to the love of our lives. So what do we do? We wait. We wait and wait and wait. Maybe we fall in love sometime, but then we start to struggle with relationships problems, which we try to explain by him or her just not being the one. It's like, oh, you know, uh, I should have seen that coming. He didn't even have a horse. <laughs> and then we start to wait again. And we wait and wait and wait for destiny finally doing its damn job. The only thing that doesn't come into our minds is that one. Taking action to make our dream come true, like we would do for any other kind of dream. When I was a student, I once sat down with my friends. It was right before a party, and we drank some beer and talked about our future. And it went like, oh, you know, I want to be an international business consultant at McKinsey. And then someone else said, you know, ah, I want to travel the world and launch this kind of online business so I can work everywhere I want to. People were sharing their dreams, and when it was my turn, I sat down and said, you know, I just want to experience this kind of life-changing, deeply romantic, perfectly imperfect, true love. You know, yeah, the feeling that is written about in books and poems. I looked into my friends' faces, and they looked at me with the same look you give a bunch of big-eyed, pitiful kittens in an animal shelter. And they were like, don't you have a real goal? I mean, something you can actually work for? Something you can achieve? Something you can measure? You know, I studied at the business department. And when my friends went back to beers and party, I could not stop thinking about the fact that we all seem to divide our dreams in two different sections. On the one hand, there are dreams that we can work for, like a career or a vacation, or a house, or a car. On the other hand, 
There are dreams that happen by destiny or luck, or maybe coincidence, like living and finding love. At this day, I started to ask myself, what would happen if I started for my dream of true love, just as my friends did for their dream of having a career or traveling the world? What if I would be able to turn the pages of my life, start a new chapter, and finally write the love story I always wished for? There are thousands of theories and books and ideas on how to make a dream come true, but they all have one thing in common. To make a dream come true, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes dedication, but most of all, it takes our own personal investment. So, for example, if you want to be an international business consultant, you better start by learning how to be a business consultant. And if you want to launch an online business, you better start by learning how to launch an online business. So if I want a true love, I better start it by learning how to love. Sounds easy, right? The problem was, the idea that I had to learn love it felt kind of ridiculous because, because I used to think that loving is an ability we all naturally have. Today I know that loving is an ability we all naturally had. We all come into this life by being able to fully love someone else without conditions. But then life happens. And most of us experience how this love can create pain. The psychologist John Bradshaw was the first to develop a theory of the so-called inner child. And his theory says that we are all born as an authentic self, which means, as a baby, we are all naturally able to feel and to express all of our feelings and all of our needs and all of our desires. But as we grow older, we experience also that these feelings, these needs, and these desires are rejected by the people we love the most. I myself experienced that I would be left alone when I dared to express my true desires. I experienced that my longing for love would only be fulfilled when I behaved the way I was expected. As a result, I unconsciously started to push away those feelings and those needs and those desires because I thought they were wrong. And without even knowing, I stopped living the truth of my authentic self and started to live the truth of my so-called false self. And this is how I unlearned how to love. This is how we all unlearn how to love. So, in fact, the process of learning how to love is actually a process of relearning. I myself dived into this process really drastically, which meant I cancelled every single plan I had for my life. I quit my job. I quit my studies. I quit my apartment in a big city. It was this love, sorry. <laughs> and I moved back to my small hometown on the country. And I remember the day I packed all of my stuff from my apartment into the car that would bring me to my parents' house, and I felt kind of adventurous, because I thought, wow, maybe this could be the beginning of my biggest dream. Well, finally, I had enough space and enough time to invest everything I had into this learning how to love thing. And I thought, wow, you made the best decision of your life. And then I remember the next day, when I woke up in my child's room and I looked at a light pink wall with a dirty dancing poster on it. And Patrick Swayze was staring at me. And I thought, wow, you've just made the worst decision of your life. <laughs> but there I was. So while my friends, went to parties or trips around the world or were launching businesses and making careers, I sat in my child's room and held conversation with the girl that used to live here 
and now kind of lived on inside of myself. And it was like, hey, what's up? Well, I think maybe we could try to fall in love sometime. Really like living our dream, sharing our life, open our heart to this handsome guy we're definitely going to meet. And she was like, are you crazy? Did you forget how painful it is to open our heart? Anyway, who should love us? We are totally not worthy of love. Well, obviously I could stop wondering why my dream of true love didn't come true. There was a part of me sabotaging my biggest wish. And it did that not because it was mean, but because it was afraid. Because as a child, I had experienced how love created pain. And now this little girl inside of me desperately tried to avoid feeling this pain again. And I mean like ever again. So I had two options. Option one, accept that this was the end of my dream. Or option two, convince this inner child of mine of deeply and truly starting to love again. So which option do you think I took? Any guesses? Two? <laughs> yeah, well, if I took one, I just could go down the stairs. <laughs> it was not the first one. I decided now more than ever to go for it. I decided to finally get back to my authentic self. And I did this by developing three questions. Three questions that savagely forced me to be honest with myself, to make sure that I was acting on behalf of my authentic self, and, and I think this is kind of the most important point, to make sure that I would take uncompromising self-responsibility for my true feelings and my true needs and my true desires. Until today, I'm, I'm permanently, every day, asking myself those questions. And to make it a little easier, I came up with only three options to answer them. And maybe you can also guess which those options are. I found a little inspiration in my teenage love letters. My options were yes, no, or maybe, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if I tell you now those questions that define how I live my life, I want to encourage you to answer them, not for everybody, but just for you. And just with those three options, yes, no, or maybe. OK, let's start. Question one. Do you think you are able to trust someone else blindly and without conditions like you did as a child? Yes, no, or maybe. For me, it's a maybe. Second question. Do you think you can give your love just for the pure and simple sake of loving? Yes, no, or maybe? For me, it's a yes, but it took me years. Question three. Do you think you are totally worthy of being unconditionally loved just because you are you? Yes, no, or maybe? For me, it's a no, but I'm working on it <laughs> right now, actually. I'll tell you something. If one of your answers has been a no, or even a maybe. You, like me, need to relearn how to love. I did, and I still do. For every no and every maybe I get, I ask myself, why not? Why the hell do I not think I'm totally worthy of being unconditionally loved just because I am me? Why? And with this simple question, I started a process of digging deep into the black hole of my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, my needs, and my desires. 
and so much more I still need to find out. It took me years to convince this inner child of mine of deeply and truly starting to love again. And as you see, I'm still not done. Even though I actually managed to fulfill my dream. I have a little spoiler for you. Today I'm married to a very handsome man and he's sitting right there. You can, maybe you've seen him. And he's the most unromantic person I know and I've never seen him on a white horse. <laughs> But in fact, He's the love of my life. The process of relearning how to love is a process of getting back to my authentic self. It's a process of exploring my false self and the process of healing my inner child. Today, I've moved out of my child's room, thank God, and into a life that is now centered around that dream I once dared to go for. Today, I would describe me as a not-so-terrible lover, but I'm still learning, and I'm still the one that buys those self-help books. I started to invest all of my time and all of my energy and all of my dedication into my dream of true love, and it paid off. Because it always does. Because the ability to love is the greatest superpower a human can have. I am absolutely convinced that we all are able to turn the pages of our lives, start a new chapter, and finally write the love story we always wished for. We just have to take the pen. And I mean, not by quitting our job and moving back into our parents' house, as I did, but by investing time and energy and dedication into our own individual process of relearning how to love, so that we can one day say, in our society, we have one, one really great ability. We are really great lovers. <laughs>